Hello, everybody. Good evening. I'm Dave Crossland, uh, the product manager for Google Fonts. Uh, thank you for coming this evening. Um, I'm very happy that we're able to offer this uh, lecture today. Uh, we've had a small hiccup with the live stream, so unfortunately that won't be working. There will be a recording available afterwards uh, in the coming days. So uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to start by uh, introducing Carol Waller, the executive director of the Type Directors Club, who's going to make a short introduction. Hi, everybody. OK, I'm going to start first with TDC. So if you didn't know, we have a new competition now called Ascenders, and it's for anyone 35 or younger. Somebody actually emailed me just the other day, angry. She's 36. What are you going to do, right? I didn't even answer. Anyway, so um, last year we had over 60 countries enter, and um, we had 18 people. So um, here it is. I left some cards outside. And and while that's going on, I just, I just want to keep going. Uh, don't forget the annual competition. We have uh, the big opening, TDC 65, on July 17th at Cooper Union. So we're very excited about that. And we're working on the book that will be ready, hopefully, even earlier this year, maybe October. So that's really super. And... Um, Back to TTC. Okay, so David Berlo. Um, I know David since we've been talking since 1987 when TDC had a conference called Type 1987. And um, it's just been fantastic knowing him and um, all these years. And I, when I was reading his bio, I was telling him I was laughing because um, it says that he entered the industry in 1978 as a letter designer for Mergenthaler. And then I remember that Mike Parker and Matthew Carter, Matthew, yeah, Matthew Carter, both worked at Mergenthaler. Then Mike and Matthew started Bitstream. And then David was with them at Bitstream. I go, oh my god, this is so fantastic. And then uh, David left in 89, and he founded Font Bureau with Roger Black. So these are all these people I know and I'm so fond of, which is fantastic. So then in 2008, David uh, launched WebType with uh, Peter Van Blocklin and others. And then in 2016, Font Bureau and other foundries created Type Network. So that's David's history, and we're going to hear all about this wonderful thing that he's doing that's so confusing to me, and uh, David Berlow. Thank you, Carol. Dave, what's your password? Dot, 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 dot. Um, the slides there are on the clicker. OK, thanks. So um, first of all, I want to thank uh, TDC for inviting me uh, once again to uh, speak in New York City. <clears throat> I love coming to New York. Um, and uh, also to Google for hosting this. It's a, a very interesting uh, situation with fonts uh, that we have today. Um, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit about the funneling of a lot of people towards a small number of designs. And then I'm going to talk about the things that we're doing, which is the search for uh, the perfect uppercase partial differential, otherwise known as a delta, and uh, a demonstration of the uses of parametric axes, which are the result of getting those right. So um, 
if you imagine what uh, fonts there were uh, with Gutenberg, uh, you know that there's one user and one font. And then uh, he maybe wanted to change it a little bit, so there was one user and two fonts. And um, by 1600, there were probably a few hundred fonts. And there's a steady growth uh, in the 1700s. Uh, periodically, there would be a, a war, and uh, the fonts would number of fonts would go down because they would come and get your medal. Um, but other than that, uh, there's been a steady rise, and you know the the type versus war was still going on. In World War II, you, most countries just stopped making type entirely, um, so that they could use those medals for for the war effort. Don't mention the war. Um, but then, uh, starting in the 70s, more and more people started to con uh, congeal around the use of s certain fonts. Uh, the f uh, it, that started with mechanical typesetters, where it was just not practical to make a font for everyone. Um, but they did try. In the early days of Linotype, just about every single font they made was a custom font for a newspaper or a magazine or some uh, major publisher. And so everything in the library was, was sort of custom then. And the other thing that happened at about the same time is that the typewriter was invented. And then you immediately had hundreds of thousands of people using the predecessors of Courier and Letter Gothic that sort of and prestige elite, I always leave that one out, but um, these things, these fonts, uh, the, the fonts I named uh, came along in the 70s, but they're based on fonts that go back to the 1880s, 1890s when the typewriter was invented. And so suddenly you had like um, millions of people using the same fonts. Uh, and th that tendency got to this, the 70s when, when digital type was first introduced, and despite the fact that the cost of producing typefaces went down dramatically uh, with the introduction of digital technology, the number of fonts that were available, uh, there were large numbers of people using a small number of, of fonts, and then there were lots and lots of people who were uh, using, the, uh, there were very few people who were using that font. And New York was one of the centers of that because there were companies like photo lettering, which had like 20,000 or 30,000 fonts, and people would use them for one campaign at a time, and then the, the film would go back into the archives and no one would see it for a year. Or there were other fonts that were being used by small numbers of people, but uh, that's the general position that there were lots of uh, uh, people using fonts for identities and stuff like that, and then people starting to congeal. And then uh, recently this, this got to be uh, a, a, a very suspicious looking situation where uh, there are literally like four billion people now using uh, Seagull, Roboto, uh, San Francisco, and uh, and uh, Noto and a few other fonts, and so the, you you have this 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 need to generalize typefaces so that they will work for lots of people. Uh, that has sort of changed the way uh, your average person looks at typefaces when they're using them. This has also uh, um, affected um, the way the uh, um, uh, other parts of the industry uh, look at typefaces. Um, so the sans serif typeface came to use as first as a symbol of modernism. It wasn't made to download faster. Or it wasn't made to render more easily. It was, it was a stylistic thing. And it sort of morphed into this thing that technology liked better than script faces or wild display faces or any other kind of font. So uh, low resolution displays were the norm and sans serifs became the types of user interfaces on computers. And um, for many years in the, in the 80s and 90s, people were arguing about whether the serif typeface would even survive uh, the digital revolution because there just wasn't that much uh, resolution uh, at that point in the revolution. Um, 
And then uh, the sans serif became the default text of computers. First, uh, uh, I think uh, some of the early word processors uh, all used uh, um, uh, sans serif typefaces. And in the meantime, there were a lot of, um, uh, there, were, there were something called front end developers who made the, uh, the uh, hardware and software that sat in front of the typesetters, and those front end systems were driving newspapers and magazines and stuff, and they had, they were driving fonts with serif faces, but a lot of them were using sans serif on the screen because it was easier to read. And then starting in the early 90s, uh, or, or, or uh, uh, just before the 90s, people started to make uh, sans serif faces for these front end systems, or serif faces for these front end systems because they had grayscale technology on them and you could get a better look at it. But the editors didn't want to use that. The editors still wanted to use regular uh, sans serif fonts for their work. Um, but uh, in the last 15 or 20 years, I think my, my, in the last 15 or 20 years, we've seen all the operating systems go to sans serif fonts, and with a few exceptions, they've sort, sort of tried to use serif faces in their identities and stuff like that. But it's it's been slow to get them uh, uh, into interfaces or anything thing like that. And then in the last five years, we've seen a lot of logos that have gone from very distinct looking. Um, uh, graphics essentially to becoming sans serif and not very distinct and so you've so there's sort of the stampede into this smaller and smaller area of distinctiveness uh, you can see the four fonts on the on on the left side are, are difficult to tell your average person can't tell them apart at all and on the right side you see a lot of uh, um, logos that when you start mixing them with sans serif fonts, they, they sort of might not even be visible. It just looks like a word or something. And um, um, so that's something that uh, the operating systems are, are uh, they have become aware of. And um, so um, it's not bad. Sans serif fonts are not bad. They obviously have a, 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 a significant role to play in communications, but they shouldn't sort of dominate things. There are a lot of different tones of voice that, bring, that type can bring you. And so uh, the, in the last few years, the technology has improved. Um, um, it's not to say that uh, the operating systems were not motivated to change things over the years. It's just that there was a lot to do about fonts that m m Almost no operating system uh, developer really understood going into it. Uh, I was working with Apple in the 90s, and uh, when we finished the first true type fonts, it was basically like I said, okay, now how about the rest of the world? And uh, you know, Apple was trying in those early days to develop a, a single product, software product they could ship to everyone in the world. And so they were trying to put all the fonts in there, and that effort has been going on nonstop. Since then, uh, uh, first at Adobe, uh, first at Apple, and then at Microsoft, and then at Adobe, and now at Google and other companies, realize that they, if they're going to serve this world market, they need to own their own fonts to do this. And uh, really, Google's the first one who said, you know, we're going to we're going to publish these open, and that sort of changed the way developers and other people can work, knowing that they have. Uh, an entire script of the world somewhere that they can count on. Um, so um, the other thing that they were that the operating systems have been working on uh, a lot is the underlying technology. You see in the top there that uh, I've, I've sort of set up this almost impossible situation where an A angstrom is being composed beneath two A's and. And uh, for many, many years, uh, the operating systems didn't really understand the difference between the ink or the pixels that were being laid down by the glyph and the space that the glyph was taking up. And so when, if you went to delete something, then it didn't know where the glyph was that it was supposed to delete. It would delete the entire box, or you'd get pieces of letters missing, uh, or a blank space in the middle of the page. There were all kinds of possibilities because there was a very simplistic view of the glyph gets put down and then you erase the same space, and that's just not the way type is 
all the time. Uh, it, even if it's 90% that way, there's 10% of the glyphs that are sticking out somewhere or something's going on. And the other thing that the operating systems have, have, have done, as I said, was all of these other scripts that, that are you know, equally or more important than Latin that have to be added to the font so that uh, more people can use them. This is also not to say that the typographic world um, has, you know, the design world has gone entirely to sans serif faces. Uh, uh, for one thing, the, the, the background that sans serif faces provides is very, very good for other typefaces to play in. So when I was founding Type Network, uh, they asked me for a specification for the fonts that we we're going to use, and my immediate reaction is gray. We want to make something gray. And what did, they, what did I mean? I said, uh, I mean by that is it's like a sans serif geometric sans, sans serif typeface because that sort of melts into the background of whatever you're, whatever else you want to put over it. It's unless it's a geometric sans serif typeface, you're not going to bother the view. So Type Network uses all these sans serif typefaces, simple geometric sans serifs, so that whatever we're showing in our font specimens is distinct and different. And the same thing happens in a lot of design. Here's book design for a Hunter Thompson and a Ralph Steadman book, where uh, you see that it's hard to call the cover a font, but it's definitely typographic. Uh, and and um, there's, there's, you know, if you look at that long enough, you realize there's just one parameter that holds it all together, and that's the angle of the face. There are no consistent stems. There are no consistent alignments. There, there's, you know, stuff going all over the place, but it's all held together by an angle. It's all about the same angle. And then down below, at the very bottom of that book, you see the name of the publisher. So the, the publisher is sort of, I'm over here. No matter who puts whatever on the cover, that's not me. I'm this sans serif in the corner. And so it, it, it does have a lot of interesting uses for, for, uh, for the designer. And then, of course, there are um, other organizations uh, that are being kept f fairly private by a, a, a recognizable combination of typefaces. Some of you may be familiar with the New York Times. It's the local newspaper. Um, and uh, uh, we work, we, we've worked with them for years to make sure that they keep their identity. As, as uh, Carol and I were talking about, uh, people have been saying things about how the industry is going to change, but it, the type part of it doesn't really change that much, I hate to tell you. It's the technology. Uh, there are fonts that have been use, in use since basically uh, visually similar to what Gutenberg did, uh, but the technology keeps changing. And so all these publishers are moving along with that technology and trying to change along with it, and the web presented any enormous barrier to them um, because they, first of all, uh, the web initially was not about presentation. It was about content. And the people who uh, made that decision stuck by it for a number of years, and they just didn't think that custom fonts would be useful. And so now, Companies like the New York Times are still scrambling to to get their paper uh, to look uh, like uh, get their website to look like the paper. And of course, the newspapers are all shrinking. I don't know if you'd notice this. And the uh, the tablets are growing. So at some point, there's going to be a place where the newspaper and the tablet are about the same size, and maybe they'll get rid of the newspaper. Uh, but that won't happen until that newspaper can look like itself on the web. And uh, many of you don't know this, but thousands and thousands of publications were destroyed by the inability to identify themselves when the web came out. And, and also thousands of, of uh, new uh, services of information were invented on the web just because they didn't have to do anything about fonts. They could use, you know, whatever the local sans serif was, and there are quite a few, you know, launches of uh, in the in the nine in the late 90s and uh, all through this century of companies that just they don't 
make any effort to, to distinguish themselves typographically. Uh, and this has changed the way that uh, the, the, the design of publications works, and uh, it's, it's proved to be very difficult. Most of the newspapers in the United States are gone now. You know, the ones that survived were the really big ones that published all over the country, or the really small ones that published in one place that the internet hasn't gotten to. But we all watched this happen in the type industry. We saw uh, all of the, what I call the little type, fled. Uh, you don't see stocks. You don't see sports. You don't see uh, want ads in this paper anymore. If you look at the contents in the 70s and 80s and 90s, a third of the paper was agate or tiny type. And uh, as that technology took over the need for people to see all that little tiny type, and they put it on the web because it's much more immediate, it's much more effective there. And so the, the news industry lost this enormous uh, revenue stream. They couldn't put their want ads online as effectively as other people uh, or, or keep up with the sports or the stocks at the speed that the internet could do it. So, so from the smallest types up, they lost that stuff. Uh, and it left them with a lot of interesting stuff to do in the paper, but uh, not much of it made any money. And so they're, they're ha they had to develop new models. And they have done that. The bigger ones have done that, but thousands of newspapers have just disappeared. So at the end of the day, with this, what the user is facing is basically a sea of sans serifs. Their, uh, their, uh, their user interfaces, um, their browser defaults, their uh, general media is swarmed with it, their mail, their social media is all uh, made out of sans serif faces. And you can make your own uh, style sheets if you want to get out of this. Very few people do that. You can change the defaults of your fonts in your system. Very few people do that. Um, you can change the operating system defaults if you want uh, to hack the hex, and even fewer people do that. So as you get up the chain of, of, uh, of type, there are fewer and fewer people changing anything that goes on. And again, this is not a bad thing. It's quick, it's easy, it's good for them to see, but everything they look at has got this monotone tone of voice. I mean, you, you know, the Wikipedia has a thousands and thousands of different topics, but they're all speaking with the same voice. And you can also see um, uh, on, in a place like Wikipedia that they've inverted the typical relationship between serif and sans serif, which is that the serif typeface is used for text because it has more information. Sans serif is basically simplified. Uh, it doesn't have the, the complexity of the terminals that we love to read with. It doesn't have uh, the, uh, the differences between the inside spaces and the outside spaces that, uh, uh, that uh, serif faces have a lot of different shapes in them and a lot of different forms that are meeting and mixing and matching, and we use that. Research has shown that we actually do see those things we can uh, quick, more quickly dis distinguish typefaces. But this is switch. The, if you go to a lot of, uh, um, even in non-Latins, uh, in uh, Japanese typefaces, they're using sans serifs on, the, on, uh, on uh, um, Wikipedia for the headlines and serif for the text. And this goes on in the Latin version too. I think they're using Georgia. Uh, they're, they're using the, the default serif for the headlines and default sans for the text. Uh, so, uh, it's a grab bag of things. I'm not even sure they know what they're what they're up to, uh, and it's it 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 works for people, uh, except that it it's just rather monotone to work with. So um, the process of you know having a foundry and being a type designer is sort of a, has been a, a, a mission creep over the last 25 years. Uh, it used to be that you draw drew a bunch of letters, 
You gave them to somebody else and they produced them. And then you drew a bunch of letters and you also produced them yourself, starting with Photographer on the Macintosh. And then you could draw your letters and produce them and you can curtain them yourself. And then you can draw them and produce them and hint them and curtain them. And do you continue to add these enabling uh, software to make more and more uh, high quality typefaces or to work in broader places. And so this underlying, the bottom line here, uh, as you can see on the slide, is, is the creation of font tools. And above that is the creation of fonts. And that's primarily what we do. We, we create fonts we would rather not have to make our own tools, but the speed the technology is move, moving is much faster than the speed that the tool makers are developing tools at. So we've had to take that on ourselves by developing Python code and all kinds of other stuff um, to keep to keep up with what's going on uh, in the in the uh, in the world of technology, and here's another example of that. I mean, we have been I've been involved with making optical sizes uh, for fonts. I've been involved in making weights. I've been uh, involved in making widths. And then in the uh, the early '90s, a uh, magazine came to me, and they were publishing uh, a magazine that uh, uh, had a lot of um, uh, very find photography in it, and they wanted that to be printed with gravure because it's much richer colors and it's beautiful. And then the pages that just had text had to have um, uh, be printed in offset. And so when they did this with the same Baskerville, they got two very different results on it. So we, we made another version of Baskerville for each one so that they could uh, uh, have a uh, uh, a different version to use for gravure and uh, uh, text. And that sort of slept for about four more years or three more years. And then it was revived by uh, the Pointer Institute of Media Studies, who was interested in newspaper uh, production and newspaper typefaces in particular. And so we, uh, a bunch of industry newspaper type people like myself and Roger Black and others, Mike Parker, got together uh, and uh, we had a conference that was organized uh, around uh, uh, sample printing being sent to, I think, 42 newspapers around the country. And they printed the same pages on each one of their presses. And we gathered them all together in Florida, which is a great place to go in the winter. And uh, we looked at all these proofs together and figured out how we could do things and then gave a presentation to all the newspaper. And that turned into something that uh, Tobias Fair Jones worked with, with which, which was called uh, grades, where you take a font and you make it lighter and bolder on the same unit system. So no matter whether you're composing for offset or gravure, the layout stays the same. And uh, uh, I think Tobias gave it the name, too, even grades. Um, and he was thinking about oil. Uh, I think it was different grades of oil, as I recall, that, yeah. that had different grades. So that's how it got to be grades. Um, and then years and years later, I was still thinking about all this stuff. Uh, as something that people wanted, and they were still interested in it. And so I started working on, on uh, how you would do grades for a whole weight axis, all the weights. Um, what we were doing then was just for one weight. Here's your regular, and here's grade one, two, three, and four. I think we maybe made two grades of the bold or something like that. And then they got to run them in their presses and choose them. Uh, by the time we got to the second round of grades, we were talking about the internet and all sorts of different rendering technologies. And so people wanted a much more industrial strength set of grades to work on uh, the screens with that stuff. And so I started thinking about, you know, what, how, how does that work? And uh, I came to realize that it was actually pretty simple. The, the top line is the bold, and the bottom line is the thin up there. Oh, got to push the button. The top line is the bold, and the bottom line is the thin, and the in between are two styles that I call airy and hairy. Airy is the thin below the black that's on the same weight. Uh, it's on the same widths as the black. And then down below is Harry, who's really black, and he looks like he's about to self-combust. And Harry is the same weight as bold, but on the widths of thin. Okay, And you can see that that style is like 
a wreck. Um, but what I can see is that if I make the thin P and R and B and A a little bit wider, then I'll have enough room for those. Okay, so I start to realize that there are there's this there's this underlying structure of uh, that you can tap into um, if you understand and work with that underlying structure instead of fighting against it. And fighting against it, I define as somebody asks you to do something fun, you go in and do it. Somebody else asks you to do something else to the same family, you go in and do it. And you just keep on doing this, and you end up with hundreds of versions that are disorganized, but everybody's happy. Right? So um, we started to think that there's probably a better way to do this. And uh, this represents the fact that you can take these four styles and put them into a, an interpolatable mass and you get every single weight and every grade of those weights. So you've got this big mass of styles with the weight axis going through it and then all of these grades going lighter or darker along that weight axis, right? So you can do that. And we couldn't figure out how to make this work because it would mean that you would have to navigate the weight axis and then navigate in another thing. And we just sort of stopped working on it for a while. And uh, then the, um, but it, it, it started something in my mind that uh, uh, this photograph sort of represents the way my brain works. Uh, <laughs> so, um, This is the part where Tolstoy has to make his appearance in every single uh, one of my uh, presentations. But, but Aristotle had this idea about the individual, that if there's one thing wrong, then that person is going to have some problems. That all people who are fine are the same, and that all people who are a little bit crazed are different. They're crazed in different ways. So, and then uh, Tolstoy picked up on this idea, and he said that it's families. It's not the individual, it's the family. The family is something that is, all happy families are the same, but unhappy families are all different. And um, he had Anna Karenina saying this. So this is, this is half, this is a, a blend between uh, Tolstoy and Karenina. You can see his beard and her jewelry on her neck and his nose and eyes. And then what sort of prompted me to remember this was Jared Diamond wrote about it in um, Blood, Germ, Germs, and Steel or whatever it was. Germs, uh, fonts, germs, and guns, right? That's what Anyways, he wrote about this and uh, he applied it to species. So you can see that people are building this idea up to bigger and bigger groups. And his theory was that it only takes one thing wrong to make it so that a horse can be ridden and a zebra can't. And I don't think it's stripes. It's something else inside of the zebra. And so, uh, you know, by implication, as my mission crept along, I said maybe the opposite is also true. That if you have control over all the independent factors, so if there's an ugly, evil Uncle Fred, and you can just turn off his gin, you're fine. Or if there is uh, something wrong with a zebra and you can go in and tweak its brain, then you can do that. And typography is not that complicated. So. Um, if you can control all the independent factors that are responsible for, uh, for avoiding typographic doom, then the ability to correct any deficiency in one factor can undoom your typographic invent, endeavor. Um, while there's a lot of control, uh, there's a lot to, to control between the type designer and what shows up on the user's screen, you can't start without fonts that can change. So uh, I recognize that there's a lot of stuff out of my control, a tremendous amount of stuff out of my control, out of my control, but there was a lot more out of my control 20 years ago as a type designer. I basically couldn't do anything about anything. Today, I can make fonts that help. And so if I can do that, then that's what we should do. And so those are the principles that started out uh, Amstelware. Uh, was the beginning of a project based on a very small, simple set of pr 
principles. First, users who co compose type professionally are only accustomed to deciding a few variables, like size, weight, and width. Often tracking and line spacing get involved, and they, you know, they usually use, they leave the contour of the character as the default, which is not drawn. And they leave uh, the color to be black, and or they make it 80% gray, but there's a limited number of decisions they make, and they don't want to make very many more. <laughs> so if one is going to give them something else, if we, it would be better if they didn't have to know about it, it just happened automatically, or if you give them something else, you want to take something away that they don't have to do anymore. Because you've given them technology, they have one less thing to think about. So that's one of the guiding principles here, because I'm not stupid. I mean, you can't just give somebody 17 new knobs and expect them to get anything done. Uh, we've already seen this in the type industry as slido-maniacs. They've been going wild for three years now with variable fonts. Um, second, with respect to the first principle, with all due respect to the first principle, there are a lot of different parameters in typefaces. One might want to control with variable font axes, and the open top type format allows the font to have 64,000 of them. Okay? So I'm not going to worry about how many I make. I'm going to worry about how many I give to the user, but those are two different things. Right? Um, and uh, the third is um, that uh, we recognize that the independent factors that I pointed out in the Anna Karenina principle, uh, and that you, you should have a framework that deals with all these various, uh, these various parameters, or it's just going to be chaos. So. Um, uh, we uh, defined a framework at the request of the alliance, the Variable Font Alliance. We defined a framework, and um, uh, it includes the definitions of, like the typical axis, like weight, which is a combination of three other axes uh, that uh, I recognized from my attempt to uh, deal with the the principle of one thing dooming. Um, Everything. So this is lighter than the weightest, lightest than the heaviest, and the way variable fonts work is that there's a default in the middle, and basically rays of style that animate out from that for each axis, and then those rays all meet. They meet each other in this design space and are added together. So um, the, this is. This represents the fact that there, that those axes, that weight axis, is actually made up of three different sets of changes. Uh, one set of changes just is about the stem weight. Another one is about the the width of the white space inside, and the third one is a change of the the contrasting weight, if there is contrast. And those three things get changed around a little bit to get from one weight to another. Um, so the idea was if you can put them, if you can have those as separate things, then something interesting is going to happen. Um, the width axis is exactly the same three parameters mixed differently. You're adding or removing more white space from the inside, you're making small changes to the weights, and otherwise it's the same three parameters over and over again. And an optical size axis, guess what? It's the three, same three uh, parametric axes changing uh, over size with the addition of the lowercase x height is also changing. As you go to smaller sizes, you make the lowercase bigger because you assume that people are going to be reading it immersively and you want to make those bigger. Um, but otherwise, it's the same three axes. There was a little bit of a hiccup in this because uh, the implementation of the variable font spec didn't really think about the fact that um, a lot of change goes on in the optical size axis. The optical size axis, as you see, the, the, the H on your uh, left 
is the small master, and the H on the right is the large master. And the object of an optical size axis, for me, is to make it so that the user can get even weights going down the page without changing the font. They can get good spacing without changing the font. And what a lot of users do to get this is they use bolder and bolder styles as they get smaller, and they track. Okay, so uh, as I said in my basic principles of doing this, if I can take that away by giving them an optical size axis, then I, I've helped something. And a lot of people are very interested in optical size because it does that. It makes it so that there's a lot less design work because the font is smart enough to know I have to have more space when I get smaller and less space when I get larger. And I have to have more weight when I get smaller and less weight when I get larger. And in the case of a, uh, a serif face like this, I have a lot more contrast as I get larger. Um, because as I see it, the serif typeface is trying to become more sans serif as it gets larger. So that at great distance, it, it, the, it's, th that elegance is brought out, but it's becoming more of of a typeface with thick serifs, uh, with with thin serifs. It's becoming more uh, more um, oriented towards you're seeing the strokes uh, as opposed to the hairline stuff. They're there the the thinner parts of a sans serif at large sizes are there for 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 tone of voice, and the other part is there for for readability. So as you move back from these larger sizes to a greater distance, you start to lose the hairlines. And so you, for example, uh, if something is being set very large and somebody's, you know that they're going to see it at a great distance, you're going to want to be able to adjust that one thing that does the changes to the hairlines of the typeface. Unfortunately, impl the implementation is what's called orthogonal. And it says that uh, only one variable value can change uh, in an axis. So if, if I've got an axis of weight, I can change the value for the weight, but no other values can change in that. And that's uh, not typographic. I mean, you can see from this picture that as the optical size axis uh, goes up and down, everything changes, basically, except that there's some black and there's some white. It's all changing. Now, you can see the values. Even though between 6 and 12, my weight doesn't change, it changes a lot between 12 and 144. The X side is changing all the way along. It's going down, the, and the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the serif thickness is as well. Uh, the format doesn't allow me to record this. And the problem with that is that you don't know what the local values are for these parameters unless you do something else. And so that's what we did. We made these other parameters, and we've written JavaScript, so we always know where we are in the design space. And there's a pretty good reason for that, because as the, as the mission crept along, um, uh, we had, we've created fonts and font tools and uh, web commerce and web fonts. And we realized as we were working on web fonts that the hinting that we were going to have to do to our web fonts to make them work all over the place was just an enormous impossibility. Um, they're, they're, uh, the, the, the transmission speeds and the size of the hints that we we're going to try to put into the fonts were bigger than the fonts themselves. And there was a decreasing number of operating systems that use hints at all. And we were, in our opinion, on the verge of a uh, resolution revolution that has since happened. Um, I, I, I was uh, convinced that this was going to happen as soon as Apple moved its uh, display technology uh, development to China um, because um, Chinese type doesn't do well with our resolutions. So the resolutions that, w that this was all founded on was wrong for a significant part of the world's uh, needs. Um, and so with the move of these technologies to being made in China, I was absolutely certain that resolution was going to go through the roof. And fortunately it has. That's helped us uh, a great deal in uh, in a couple of ways. But I'm sort of a traditional thinker. And when I think about the mechanisms, uh, you know, as we were, as uh, lots of people were talking about this, 
it became common for people to think that there ha there was something had to happen to change the way things were because as we as I said before the fonts weren't changing but the technology was changing dramatically and it was having an effect on what fonts were being used it's having an effect on the fonts and you don't want that sort of feedback from the technology to affect the way people express themselves ideally I mean there's some people that probably do um, so there were a lot of people who were thinking like me that were thinking there has to be some sort of a mechanical revolution on all this stuff or software revolution to make it happen and I'm traditional I go back and you know the, uh, there's a lot of people who say that this is the single greatest and most important invention in the history of human humankind this is a, a hand mold for casting letters oh I gotta push the button I, oh, I missed two slides, three slides. Somebody remind me. Anyways, this is this is uh, the hand mold that was uh, uh, invented shortly after Gutenberg. There's absolutely no evidence, uh, contrary to what's said in a lot of places, that he had one of these. Um, none whatsoever. There's, there's, he didn't write about it, he didn't talk about it, he didn't draw one, he didn't leave one. His fonts don't look like they used one. His typography doesn't look like they used one either. Um, so somewhere between Mainz and uh, the Low Countries, somebody came up with one of these. And what this does is it allows somebody to put one of these things in their pocket or onto a train of carts and go off and run around the countryside making fonts for people. And um, it's got variations. Those yellow screws are variables for changing the what we call today line spacing and letter spacing. Because the, the matrix, which was a flat piece of metal with a mold in it, is put into this thing and locked up flat. And then the, the thing that squeezes it together is making it so that that one surface, which has your letter, can have different sizes. As long as you don't overshoot the letter, you can, you can give it more or less line spacing, moving the line up, up and down, and you can give it more, more or less horizontal spacing with those screws. You can't change the glyph, but you can change the spacing. And this is important to people because if you're setting type 10 on 12, uh, and you've got 10 point type, that means you've got to add this little thin piece of letting every single time somebody composes a line, they've got to add a piece of letting to it. And for a newspaper or a magazine, that can cost a billion dollars a year. Well, not a billion, a million in today's money maybe. But back then when you're hand setting type, it made a big difference if the type was on the right, on the right line spacing. And also people wanted to, to set type wider or narrower um, for various markets or people, and you could get, you know, spacing added or deleted from the font in the typecasting pro pro process. And this later went into mechanical uh, type two, that you could adjust things uh, in, in mechanical type to do it, to do that. And so the, crept, the creeping of the mission sort of, uh, you know, in 2015, we, the spec came out and within about five or six months, I think, we had introduced this framework to the, the, the consortium or the alliance that was working on it. And uh, a lot of people have interest in it. It's a little bit more than they had in mind at the time. I think that just solving width, weight, and optical size is all they wanted to do. Um, but the alliance has a variety of, uh, uh, of ideas. And so I think that it's going to go on. We're going to have this framework. There are, I, there are a few hundred people working with it now, I know. But this also raised the issue that there's this underlying mantra that I'm not going to go into a great deal of depth with. But I didn't know about it until I tried to fix something thing with hinting when somebody at Microsoft said, oh, David, that's not how the mantra works. And I said, what mantra? And so it was explained to me that there's this line of decisions that starts with the script and ends with the last possible effect uh, that you're going to do to the typeface if you're going to have a uh, green outline and a uh, yellow interior of the font with a drop shadow or something. Those are all treatments uh, or effects that happen at the end of it. The very beginning of the stuff is hidden to most users because they choose their script when they install their system. and They choose their language. So uh, in the old days, you didn't have to answer all these questions. You know, when you're done saying I'm setting Latin and it's going to be this, you know, Padoni 17 point regular. That's the end of it. You didn't have to say anything else. But today, computers need to have 
answers to everything. So whether or not you know it, there's defaults for like dozens and dozens of things that when you specify a font, if you don't specify anything to happen, then the default happens. But these things in the match are going all the way along the decision tree, the decision line from your script to the last rendering detail that has to be done. It's, it's happening, it happens with every single piece of type today. And so the, 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 the interesting thing about uh, our framework and the ability to manipulate typefaces is that if, you, if applications don't know where they are in the mantra, if you try to go up mantra, in other words, if you go from, I've just finished saying I'm gonna use this weight, and then the boss comes in and says, oh, by the way, we're gonna do this in Chinese instead of Latin, then you have to change, you have to go basically start over again with everything. Um, but if there's knowledge in the system about what, how these changes interact with each other, it's entirely possible that you go back and make a relative change and have everything else still working out pretty well. So knowing the relationship between the steps that somebody is going through in an application, an application developers really have given up on this sort of. If you select a bunch of things, for example, that have a bunch of attributes to them, it just gives up. Even if they all may be red, or they all may be 12 point, or they all may be uh, um, bold, you, you, you can't do anything about it because it doesn't know. It doesn't know how these things weave together. And so uh, we, we did a little bit of work on this in, in the, the early 80s uh, with, a, with a technology called OpenDoc that was pre-web, and OpenDoc was based on the fact that you had this container that could contain anything, and when you picked something in that container, it had attributes that would bring up menus and show you, this, this is all familiar today because this is the way it works, but this was sort of a revolutionary, revolutionary idea there that back then that you could have this, and so we started working on the user interface issues with True Type GX fonts at the time, and the application developer said, "Wait a minute, we can't, we can't really do this." And that was really the reaction to True Type GX all over the place: is that, that the the applications had already done some of this stuff by themselves, and they didn't want anything else to take it over, and they didn't know how to do the other stuff that we were talking about, so they just gave up. So, um, oops, that was that creeping slide. So, we've gone into. Uh, you know, from the creation of fonts all the way down to the creation of variables and a typographic suggestion engine. And this is, this is the, uh, uh, the part of it that takes a lot of the trouble out of the user's hands as much as we can possibly take out of it while improving their quality and not necessarily denying them access to this stuff, but having them be volunteers instead of Gang press, and you know. So, in my traditional view of things, that would uh, be a horrible thing to give a user this many sliders. And in fact, as almost as soon as we made this uh, this font happen, uh, it was suggested that uh, we uh, that the format have a way to hide them. So, so there's a hidden access. Uh, capability now in in uh, variable fonts um, so that I can do things for the user and they don't have to see them. Uh, um, I'm showing it now so that you, you sort of get an idea of, of uh, 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 how many screws there would be <laughs> in, a, in, a, uh, in a type mold if we were doing this because now we're able to control the glyph. See, uh, and because the white space uh, that we used to control is very, very well controlled by applications. You have letter spacing uh, in applications and on the web, and you have line spacing in applications on the web. We don't really have to worry about that in the fonts anymore. In fact, it's very dangerous to worry about those things in fonts because if the fonts contain any information about line spacing or the fonts contain any information about letter spacing, then you're compelled to deal with the intersection of the user's use of spacing and the font's use of spacing, and that creates an, a, a huge, for example, uh, if I have a spacing axis and I have kerning in the font, then uh, I have to kern the font a lot more. I have to kern the font for all the spacing options, that are, as, as opposed to turning the tracking over to the, uh, the operating system 
or the application, which combines uh, the tracking and the kerning together and um, does the right thing, basically. And I'll get to that a little bit more in a second. But uh, what we ended up doing was we have these three axes. It's going to look like any other font that anybody would use. And those are all the familiar axes, weight, width, and optical size. And we're not giving anybody any extras. But then inside, at every single location in the design space, you have these other adjustments you can do. And those other adjustments are to the parts, the, the things that were blended together before. They're the same things. So that um, um, uh, this is going to be a little bit blurry, so I'm going to apologize in advance. But um, on the left is a paragraph of text, if I click, that is only using the word space to justify. And um, I should say at the beginning that big word spaces and hyphenation are I hate. Uh, hyphenation causes more trouble than it solves, and it destroys the reading process by having hyphenation. And huge word spaces make people's eyes fall through the lines because they're not being held up. The word space gets too big, and you fall through the line into the next line. Uh, you may experience this uh, subconsciously. I experience it consciously. When I'm reading and the word spacing isn't right, I just stop. I can't stand it anymore. So um, what we've done is with this, this is a simple demo, but uh, we recognize that we've got tracking and the user can use tracking and we use tracking uh, in this demo. And uh, we have the word space, the tracking, and the internal space. And that's all. That's, this is, you get control of all of it. And so once you've got control of all of it, there's nothing else to control. And you can do what you want. And, in, in, and what we've done in our case is we've written an algorithm that um, looks at the difference between the line and the line that's got to be. And then it distributes the difference out among everything. So you get these, this text that looks like it was composed by hand, um, as opposed to being um, every single glyph is the same, every single line on the on your right is a different instance that if I go back a couple are floating around that that one there okay so there's a whole bunch of and we're working with very very narrow, narrow ranges one of the things that annoys me most about when people get their hands on variables is they move things around a lot but I think about variables as something that you just finally adjust something. And so uh, these, th these, this, we're just using one parameter here, just the internal white space. The external white space is being taken care of tracking along with the kerning because those are actually one thing. The basic spacing and the kerning of a typeface is basically one thing. Together, they, they space the character out. You don't want to separate those or treat them differently in any way. You want them to be treated together all the time. So that just leaves the internal white space. And the internal white space, I can make a, it's called an X transparent C axis. I can add that to a lowercase in about five hours. It's not a big deal. It's, you just added 10% width adjustment in either direction, and you've got what you need. And as we were moving along, um, uh, experimenting with this, oops, um, we discovered that it wasn't the same formula for distributing the differences at all sizes. So at small sizes, your letter spacing is extremely fragile, and you don't want to mess it. But you can do a little bit more with the letters, because they're really small. You can move them around a little bit. And you don't want to mess too much with the word space, but you can change a lot. And at large sizes, you don't want to mess with the letters very much, because people can see the differences between them. And um, you can mess a lot with the word space, because larger text, the word space is you know, there to be messed with, uh, especially for justification. And the letter spacing is a little bit less um, sensitive at large sizes. So we have this, al this, this algorithm that changes over the size range, and I suspect that this is going to be true of some of the other things that we're doing as well. <clears throat>
Here's another use that sort of uh, instead of going from a serif face that you know somebody's made artwork for you and they've scaled it down and now the hairlines are disappearing. Um, well, you can have uh, in about two hours you can make a, a, what I call a Y opacity axis, which is the hairline control, and uh, you can. Adjust that for smaller sizes so it doesn't burn out. Two things. You can save a logo in your spare time or make up your own and then save it like I've done here. And then a third example is, you know, a very minor thing. Um, but uh, in a lot of traditional typography uh, or in typography in general, the line spacing is dependent on the column width for ideal purposes. It's not very much done with this in the web today, you see a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, long lines that uh, go all the way across the screen and are too long. But for type that's set at about f between 55 and 65 characters across, which is sort of what people agree with is, is the ideal, you have a, you have a, a lo more line spacing because the user has to get all the way back to the beginning and you want to make sure that that's clear and then with narrow columns you have less line spacing because there's less recovery time and they can do it faster. And um, traditionally people would vary the descenders for these things. So that uh, in, a, in a, a narrow column with shorter line spacing you would have short descenders and uh, for longer lines with with more line spacing you'd have longer descenders and this uh, there are a number of typefaces uh, that uh, exhibit this in, in history and you can see it in various places um, and there are other values uh, that there are other there's other value for these things too uh, as we demonstrate in another demonstration I'll tell you about later is that uh, when you're mixing scripts or you want uh, say uh, Arabic and Latin to work together they have different relationships to the M square uh, and so does Chinese and Arabic and Chinese and Latin. They all have different uh, uh, relationships to the M square. And if you're going to make them work together, then you need to be able to adjust the the, uh, the way they work with the M squares. And one of the things that uh, I, I saw for years when I was first looking at uh, uh, the Latin fonts in, in Japanese uh, fonts were completely different from the fonts that we were, we were making. And we would all say, well, it's terrible. But uh, I eventually realized that it wasn't terrible. It was what was needed. Um, they were making lighter, they were making their Latin lighter than we would typically make it because they have more complex characters. And if they make it as dark as we make our dark text faces, there isn't enough room for all the strokes they've got in the, in the glyphs. It just doesn't work. And so that might make you wonder how they're all based on Helvetica. But uh, I can tell you there's problems with basing things on the weight of Helvetica if you're working with uh, Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. There's, there's, a, there's an issue where the default for those faces is lighter than the default for Latin is. There's also Latin has a, a, a different relationship between the cap height and the M square uh, than Chinese. And the way the Chinese fits on the M square, you have to pick the descenders of Latin up to ridiculous uh, amounts. You can see fonts that have been made this way in the past. But that's not wrong. It's what's necessary to make that f those two fonts work together, those two scripts work together. So. Um, besides having lots of value in working with, uh, with Latin fonts, in working between scripts is a whole nother ball game that, that you can apply parametric axes to, and we have done that. Am I over time? I better quit. And so um, we have uh, created a demonstration of these things that uh, I can uh, show you some of. Um, do I have to switch? Can you switch me over to, do I do something? Oh, I'm looking over here. Oh, there it is. It's just a delay. I guess it's going out to California or something and coming back. <laughs> 
So um, obviously you can see from this that they're width, weight, and optical size axes. And I also, um, there's a checkbox here so I can, I can uh, link the uh, optical size axis to the size. So that when the user says I want 12 point, they get 12 point optical size. There, there is only one application that's doing this right now. It's text edit on the Mac. Just sort of is automatically um, giving you the optical size when you choose the point size, if it has an optical size. Series bug um, is that uh, if you go beyond the optical size ranges, it goes back to the default. Instead of scaling from the largest size, it loses its mind. So uh, that's been reported, and uh, the other developers know that that's not a good idea either. Um, so uh, I can turn that off, though, and, and uh, just make grades happen and experiment with, with uh, different typefaces. Oops. And I, I use this primarily to uh, uh, test my glyphs. Um, oops, I keep getting this. Oh, I'm not on a Mac. <laughs> Never mind. Um, I, I use this to test all my glyphs, and uh, um, uh, I think we're going to be releasing in a few weeks for other people. It's not, it, it's not as uh, sort of uh, interesting and popular as as uh, Access Praxis, but it's built more for for looking critically at uh, at uh, uh, fonts. There we go. Oh, I can't do that. I'm, I'm not getting a font menu at all. Okay, anyways, um, so uh, you have control over column widths, and this is what we basically use to, to develop our line spacing algorithms. I, we have sort of three or four people sitting around who, who uh, look at these things, and we, we gather our decisions together and then decide on how we're going to uh, do this. Because the fonts themselves are very flexible. We can put any spacing anywhere we want, we can, uh, and we can move the algorithms around for, for doing this. Uh, because what we're trying to do is deploy uh, beyond the font typography that makes it so that it's very easy for people to, uh, um, to use them. Uh, we also have a view all access in case somebody doesn't want everything to be hidden. And we have uh, control. Here you see the uh, Y opaque axis being controlled. And this is valuable for something like uh, 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 old clear type rendering or um, some uh, Mac retina screens. Uh, don't do very well with, with hairlines. And, and all you have to do is put you know one little value into your code, uh, your web code, and you can fix that now. Um, the other uh, site I want to show you is, uh, this is uh, sort of what we're calling the variable fonts brochure. Internally, it is uh, basically uh, uh, sections on uh, every topic that we covered so far along the way of the mantra, uh, from script out to the last bits and pieces of uh, effects that you uh, uh, might put on the type. And we are um, slowly saying, this is what it was like before. So here's what it looked like. There was one family was many files uh, before variables. And now uh, variable families are uh, you know, one file doing everything you want. Um, how the styles come out of old old families, and how the styles come out of new families, and then there are um, examples of uh, uh, like the one I showed you, and you can go into uh, um, a lot of these examples and actually uh, um, play with them to see how they work. And you can see here's one with just word spacing, here's the word spacing and letter spacing, and then there's the three of them used together. So you can see a, a variety of things. And there are a couple of them where you get to go in and actually uh, experiment with the example. You can go into the, the, the HTMLs on the left and the CSS on the right, and you can go in and, and actually you know write code. And you can see uh, 
down below on the on your right side, you can see all the various parameters. And we recognize that those names aren't great, but you've got you were limited. I mean, the technology says you've got four letters, and uh, not every axis can be named with four letters, with that makes sense. And so I've just decided that each letter is going to stand for something, and uh, people can argue about the names. Later, I don't have to put those names in the interface. I don't have to show them to anyone. Um, people who are working with this have slowly gotten used to speaking in this language. And so you could come into, if you come into one of our meetings, it's sort of like an alphabet soup of stuff going on. And people go, wait a minute, which, which one is XTRA again? Uh, so I, I constantly am using, I have a puppet show that goes on. It's this one, it's this one, you know, and oh yeah, OK. Um, and so we're having a lot of uh, 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 fun with this stuff, um, but at the same time, we recognize that it's it's a serious business um, because of the the fact that the technology of fonts has been out of step with the technology of publishing uh, since the web was launched and responsive uh, requirements came in. Um, uh, so we've got a lot of catching up to do, and uh, and I hope that. Um, uh, we can do it together. Thanks so much. <laughs> Any questions from anyone except for Dave? <laughs> Dave. Any questions? So uh, if anyone has any questions, there's a microphone over there and here. If you'd like to come up and ask it, that will help for the recording. So yeah, I have a, a question. So you've uh, been developing Amstel VAR uh, as a, in the serif typeface for a couple of years. Um, uh, what do you make of other people's, you know, have you seen other people attempting to use your Axis framework? I have. And, you know, do you have any advice for them? Uh, keep it up. The, uh, the principles that I said at the beginning are really the most important thing. You're never going to run out of axes. Don't worry about it. But you're going to run out of user patience. So um, there are a lot of axes that I see that do one thing. They, uh, they'll change something that's design-oriented about the font. And um, I, I call this a, uh, a, a good fishing font. And phishing is like you are going to decide things by uh, your visual interaction with it. And that is really great for design. I mean, that's how design is done, by phishing. Um, uh, an, an example of the opposite, figuring, is that you want to be able to um, figure out how these particular typographic tones of voices are going to play out over different portals, different renderings, and stuff like that. And you don't want to have to look at everything. You want to be able to make some decisions about what you want to change in the font, make those changes, look at it, and then have an interpolation or an extrapolation being done for you of how those get implemented out. Or in the case of justification, you just don't want to know about it. You just want to say smart justification. Turn on the smart justification. And set your hyphenation to like nine letter words <laughs> so that you never get two in a row ever with, you know, with three before. I mean, you can just crank up how uh, the hyphenation can be defeated with this other thing helping you. So that is like, uh, it's a double win because it's, the person uses it automatically. Uh, so when designers are working, they, I think they want to offer people the right things. I mean, there's an audience for fishing, and there's an audience for figuring. And uh, if you address the font to the wrong audience, you get nowhere fast. I mean, they turn it off really quickly. If you give somebody a 17-axis font that's mostly for figuring, so that you're, you're saying, you know, I'll show you how to use this, and you can go away and write code for it, and not have to look at everything. Everything. If you give uh, that to the wrong person, they'll start bashing around the sliders and fishing with it. And uh, if you give um, 
somebody who's fishing uh, or somebody who has to figure a font that just is changing its tone of voice all the time, they're not going to really be able to use it. So it's, uh, I, I, since I've been in this industry independently, I mean, after I left Lion Type and Bit, Bitstream, uh, I've always put myself in the position of the client and the user and the reader uh, because um, they don't know us at all. They don't know what we're doing. So even explaining to people uh, all the details, just it, it doesn't affect most people. So you have, to, you have to affect them with the typography, and the best way to do that is they don't know. They don't know. The fonts are right. No typographic doom. They don't know. And there's a lot of people who don't feel that way when they read now. They know. They can see that there's something wrong. Or that, you know, I hear people, you know, I put this book down because I couldn't stand the type. And, you know, for centuries I never, I don't think people were saying that. I think that there was just a lot more concern. Uh, about every single line of every single page that just doesn't exist anymore. It's not possible because of the volume of information. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. It's just the way it is. And we've got to get tools for people so that they can get back to the point where uh, they like to read more. Because uh, video takes up too much space for what it does, as far as I'm concerned. You know, fonts are so much more efficient, you know. And a picture may be worth a thousand words, but everyone's got a different thousand words. You know? Anyway. I see you back there. Um, so I have a, a question for you about um, relative file size. Um, I have to move closer because I'm part deaf. When I first got the invitation, I thought it was live screaming because I do a lot of screaming about fonts. Yeah. Um, so, so my question was about um, relative file size between, uh, like, say, one of the earlier versions of Amstelvar that has a simple weight axis versus what you're doing now where that weight axis that I see might be moving three other things underneath. Yeah. So I guess, you know, given that you have the number of different axes in Amstelvar now that, that are not seen, and I look at it and I see four, I'm just curious if you've seen differences in the in the relative file sizes once those things are actually. Compiled. Well, it's going to go down if I can do it my way. I mean, if the, the weight axis is now recorded as a whole set of, uh, as a, a whole set of uh, what we call glyph variations, GVARs, so those have to be stored now. They don't, they don't, they don't need to be. And there's a hack now, as you've probably heard, where if you name three different axes with the same name and hide two of them and show one they'll be automatically blended, right? Actually, if I name, well, I I, I'll, you'll understand. If I have, uh, if I have a weight, something called a weight axis and it has no change whatsoever, I have another thing called a weight axis that changes one of my parametric axis and two other things called weight axis that also do that and they're all called weight axis and these three are hidden and that one's shown. The way that the software works right now, it's going to take everything that's a weight axis and show it to the user. So it blends those automatically. Now that's the hack. It's not a great way to do things. But it, if, if, if I, and in that scenario, I have to store that, the default axis twice again. And then I'm storing these other axes essentially once, but I don't have access to the whole axis because only part of it is being used for that thing. So the system that I've got is that you've got these axes, you have full access to those axes. I'm starting to get sick of that. And you also have them presenting these other axes for you as blends. And that's the ideal shape uh, size-wise. It, it, it's the smallest you can get. There's no, and that's one of the things that bonked me on the head about this is that we have a lot of stuff to compress. We have a lot of compression to do it. This is one issue, uh, and th th that's the kind of compression that I'm talking about that's piled on top of future possible compressions. Because right now, uh, CJK is not being very compressed by variables, and it could be much more complex, complex, compre compressed by variables. There are actually f uh, fewer strokes, unique kinds of strokes, in Japanese than there are in Latin. 
right? Um, so the, the, the Japanese is made up of a, a fairly small number of scro strokes and then a large or number of radicals with a lot of variety in them. But if you can tame that whole system, and there are five or six systems already doing this, making recipes for kanji uh, that compress the font hugely, uh, but they haven't gotten the quality yet. But with variable fonts, it's possible to do that. And so you have this one compression on top of another compression, where uh, you've got these axes. You know, theoretically, for a Chinese font, you don't need as many of them as you have for Latin font because there are fewer alignments, for example, in Chinese. And so um, you have uh, the ability to compress it by having these uh, these component axes build all this stuff. And then on top of that, you have a much more complex and rich way of uh, of referencing uh, the radicals and strokes of glyphs from other places in the resolution, uh, from other places in the design space. So, I mean, um, when you when I was talking about the fact that uh, it's very difficult to choose the same weight for Chinese and for Helvetica, because there's enough room in there. If you look at the more complex Chinese characters, there's some range of the weight axis going on inside of them. You know, as you go into the character, the, char the, the radicals are getting lighter and lighter. And you can see this in display and in text to a certain extent. And that's an optical, that's a function of optical size. As the font gets bigger, everything has to get evener, or it can get evener as it gets bigger because there's more space and the user is, it's bigger for the user to see, so the white spacing can get smaller. But um, in order to take advantage of that stuff, you've got to build from the very beginning. It's not so easy with CJK as it is with Latin. I mean, I can add these parametric uh, axes to Latin after the fact, but in, in the development of CJK, you've got to start that way, or you can't really get to the, to the final product as effectively as possible. So um, your, your original question, I don't really care about space. I understand that it's important, but in the development process for these fonts, I can change the size of the font after I'm done. Uh, I can make it smaller. It's very difficult to make it bigger by, by dividing things up. At the beginning, I have all the tools I need to make everything go, go you know, in various directions. I can add axes. I can subtract axes. I can divide axes. Uh, today, by you know, I can by character group. I can say, okay, uh, this font's going to need to have uh, the weight axis for the regular for the caps in lowercase be separate because uh, for something or other, and so I can just split the axis apart. So the axes uh, of variable fonts are fairly flexible, um, uh, and uh, th so I like to produce like a gigantic complex thing and then simplify it as much as I can, uh, both for the user and for uh, the purposes of transmission. But uh, we've seen uh, year after year that, uh, you know, you, if, if, when you simplify the font for the technology, then the technology grows and the font becomes too simple again. So I think it's, it's, it's important that the, the, the masters of these things be really um, complete and as high quality as possible, especially if you're moving into an environment where they're being served because uh, the service can make it a glyph. You know, well, we were talking about this earlier today that uh, uh, there's a range of subsetting of, uh, of a variable font that goes all the way from just take this variable font and get rid of that glyph or take this variable font and keep that glyph. And there's this huge range of stuff in between. That's glyphs, axes, uh, glyph groups, scripts, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and um, uh, it's, I think that, that that's the future for some of the, dread, uh, you know, the dreadnought faces are going to be these gigantic things that uh, they're downloadable, they're portable, um, but they can be uh, made a lot smaller, degeneralized for a specific user. And this degeneralization is like all over the place. I mean, degeneralization for style is something that we can do now. And degeneralization for, for the glyphs that somebody uses is something. So um, I, I, I appreciate 
that size is a, is a, is a, is a central issue for people. Uh, and I also appreciate the fact that uh, variable fonts have sort of got in the door based on size, based on the compression that they bring. Um, um, but it's the first time that that compression has come with increased possibilities of quality. I mean, that, I mean, if somebody had told me that was going to happen 20 years ago, I would say, eh, it's not going to happen. How can that happen? How can you? It's the only way that I've been able to get a conversation started with clients is by winning with performance, then you can start to do Yeah, I, and I, so I completely understand that. I completely understand that you win by performance, and then you, you, you get other things from it. Um, so there, there are lots of ways to present. You can present almost any typographic uh, solution with, uh, um, with variable fonts as partly uh, compression, because it's all compression. Um, they just have to use more fonts, and they get more compression, right? I mean, I think that we did some sort of, I don't know, what was it, three styles? Three styles of, uh, I think, Roboto. Uh, is bigger than the variable font. So you don't have to push them very far stylistically to get them to be saving stuff. Now that may just be true of a sans serif, it may be a serif font, you gotta use five. But, you know, using f five fonts in a serif font is, is not that difficult because the optical size has become that much more important. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's a more basic one, but when I, using Roslindale, that cut the font load in half, shifting that to variable from the static ones. And yeah. that was three, I think. Same yeah. is true with um, source serif as well. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if somebody's using fewer than three fonts, we're not going to get to them. And that's okay, because somebody's using fewer than three fonts is probably not very typographically interested in anyways. And so there's a whole bunch of stuff that plays off against each other, where variables are more complicated and they're better, and they're, but not everybody needs them. Um, the people who need them are going to use them. And I think that it's going to be a big thing for the operating systems because of the savings that you get in downloading to people uh, from styles. If you download, uh, you know, the, the thing with three fonts, if a user goes to five different sites that are using six different uses, styles of Roboto, you've, you've, you've already saved a tremendous amount there. So. Yes, sir. I have a question about what this technology causes you to potentially worry about one way or the other. I mean, you've talked about how it's wonderful in, My in, age. in, a, in a bunch of different ways. But when you change a technology for a type, uh, then you get effects on design. In, in every case, you go from metal to phototype and then to digital type. Each time there's a change of the technology, it has not always foreseen changes come to the type design itself, the character. The oh, design. yeah. And I'm wondering, people, you know, they will uh, complain about the changes or they'll be in love with them, as the case may be, you know, depending. Um, but I'm wondering what kind of changes, what tendencies do you think we're going to see with variable fonts? And to what extent are you worried about those tendencies being malign? Okay. Uh, the answer is yes and no. <laughs> I, when we were first working on, on GX variations fonts, nobody had the faintest clue about animation. It just, you know, didn't occur to them. We're, we're looking at, we didn't have very good tools for making things animate anyways. But, you know, animation is a huge thing that's going to happen with variable fonts. And, um, it's good and bad. I mean, there's, there's, people are looking at regular fonts now and w wanting them to animate when they're, they're doing something completely different. You know, I mean, I've got people, you know, scrambling around with Amstelwar, uh, and uh, you know, saying what a good animation font it is. But so, I mean, you know, there's a danger that somebody can take your font and use it for animation, but when you made it for a high quality text. Uh, but you know, there's, there's a lot of stories about these I could tell about. You know people finding their fonts being misused. But that's not, you know, I mean, we're, we're here to provide a utilitarian thing, and there's nothing that says that somebody has to use it right. I mean, you know, uh, I've seen uh, Peter Sellers step on the wrong end of a, f of a rake a hundred times. 
um, and clunk himself in the head. And that's not a reason to make rakes differently. I mean, if you make a rake totally flat, then it it might work sort of if you go like this, but and no one will step on it. But then they'll probably you know leave it against a tree and stab themselves or something. I I I don't you know my job is to do the best thing I can do, and um, the unforeseen stuff that goes on is 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 always interesting. I mean, I love watching it. Don't you? What are you worried guess, about? What I'm what I'm wondering about is is do you think that there's there's something about this technology that will be deterministic about the aesthetics, the, the expression uh, at all? Uh, no more than digital type, right? I mean, digital type made those changes happen, uh, both you know, in the society of our industry and in you know, the, the way people, uh, you know, everything got sharp corners, just about. I mean. You know, if if you want to make a font that's got dull corners like metal, you're welcome to do it all the time. How many people do it? You know, I've done it maybe five times, and I'm going to do it now in variables a lot because you know it's just a, it's a, an extra point. It's one extra point. You can have as many rounded shapes on the edges as you want. You can go back to things that are not so harsh with them. So I think that you know there's always danger, but. The, the, the possibilities that it opens up for quality and, and uh, performance and uh, liveliness, you know, typographic liveliness is, uh, is kind of endless. So, I'm excited. I'm excited. Um, I have a question about, I guess, process um, as far as like implementing like this parametric axes approach. Yeah. Um, is this something that you think um, is something that could apply to like be applied to like taking pre-existing designs and an excellent them? excellent I, uh, an excellent question. Um, and I did the same font twice. Amsalar, uh, the alpha uh, we did um, purely by parametric it's a new face. I didn't know what it's design space was going to be like because we were uh, working with a client who had never made a variable font before and we hadn't done one in 20 years. So I was experimenting and I didn't know exactly what it was going to look like. So I started with the parametric axes and ended with the registered axes. Okay? And then in version 2, I have the registered axes <laughs> and they like them. So now it's the it's job of polishing those and then adding the parametric axes onto them. So you can go either way. This is one of the great things about this particular framework. It's not like you, know, you mix yellow and red and then you get orange and that's the end of that. You can unmix them. You can just go I back. My question is, like, do you, is that something that, you, that needs to necessarily be started with? Like... If it doesn't need to. Okay. I mean, um, you can you can just take an existing font, like I said, and in you know a few hours you can add an X transparency axis to the lowercase of an existing font. So now you've got your weight axis and your width axis maybe, and then you you know you take the default of that thing and you do something else to it, and you can take the default over and over again. And everything every time you add that axis, you're getting it added to these other fonts. So you can build up a font from nothing to the design, or you can take a design and deconstruct parts of it, leave it the way it is. You're not you know, changing what you've got, digitized. You can deconstruct the other things that you need. I mean, the simplest example is you can take any font you want and you can add descender length changes to it in 45 minutes and then spend an hour and a half on the G. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's just that there's, there, it's, it's, it's a very flexible system because the technology is just like adding these things and subtracting them and doing stuff for you. And you get to see it live. I mean, there are tools now where you can see it live. And, you know, you can just keep revving and doing things. Now, um, there, there, uh, there's no reason why you can't do it both ways. I think, uh, and it, it, it's up to you whether... Was this something, this idea, did this come to you from the variable font format, or did, were you, was this idea kind of... Um, this came from this Anna before? Karenina. 
Okay. <laughs> it had nothing to do with the font format. Well, the font format. it was playing against the font format. Okay. But it started long before that. I mean, I was working on trying to figure out what the heck I was doing with GX variations. And I got so lost, I thought my partner was going to call for an intervention. I mean, there was, a, there was just like, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't understand this stuff. So, I mean, we had weight axis and width axis and optical size axis by that, back then, and that was it. And if I tried to do anything else to them, it just all exploded, and I couldn't figure out why. And it's because I was just adding another color to brown, and it was just getting browner. And it wasn't until, you know, years later that I figured out that there's, uh, you know, the grades thing sort of started this gigantic uh, eureka moment. Uh, I wasn't in a bathtub, but... Uh, there was there was just a it was just like it all of a sudden just like whoa wait a minute you know that that's right that's how it works and you know the picture that I had of the way the grade axes work I didn't know how I was going to make that work but then when I put it into vari variations it worked I have grades all along all the weights and all the widths and there are grades everywhere and it just works so there's a certain amount of worrying uh, because I hadn't played with technology for a number of years. And then, but then after that, it was just like, oh, that's all clear. Yeah. And there are different groups of axes in the framework. I mean, there, there's stuff that has to do with weights and widths of glyphs, and there's stuff that has to do with heights of glyphs. There's stuff that has to do with motion of glyphs and other stuff. And so the, the framework went as far as I could go in the things that we had done before and that we started to do with the next round of variations that didn't have anything in the operating system that knew what to do with them, right? So when a glyph gets up and moves, the only way that the user can know how far it's gone is by trial and error. And a user using uh, something for animation is interested in distance and rate and time. Right? So they need to know the, what the variation, what, the, rate, what the, 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 the cycle of that variation is and how long it, you know, if you want the bike rider to ride across the screen realistically, you have to know what the turn of his feet is versus the space that he's moving or a dinosaur or something, which, you know, otherwise you don't know. So, you know, you, there's a lot of different stuff in the framework that covered different things that we didn't know how to talk to developers about back then. Now there are a lot more developers and they're, you know, they're interested in this stuff. Of course, most developers are so busy fixing bugs that they don't want to add any features, but you know, there are other developers that do want to add features. So. Anyone else? I have one more question, David. Yes, David. Uh, so I think optical size is a very important concept in this. this it idea is. Of, um, as the physical size of the type is increasing, there's a lot more room, so there's a lot more uh, variation in weight and width that can happen. So you get this kind of upside down Eiffel Tower yeah. design space. Yep. Where at the bottom, you know, at six point, you just don't have a lot of room to move in. Yeah. But way up at, say, 144 point, there is a lot of room there. Yeah. Um, when taking, you know, any typeface, uh, often, you know, type uh, designers will say, well, this is a typeface that's made for a range from 18 to 24 point, or, you know, this is from 8 to 16 point. Do you think that there's a way to uh, sort of assess a uh, typeface um, and determine what it's kind of ideal optical size usage is um, and, and where it fits on that kind of upside down. Eiffel well, tower. as you as you know, an optical size is not a size. It's the range of sizes. And so if you're going to follow the principle of taking trouble away from the user and replacing them with something, you want to make it so that the font that you're giving them at a different size fits that bill, right? It doesn't need to be tracked if it's larger or smaller, and it, you don't have to change the weight if it's larger or smaller. So that's the goal. You're trying to do 
And it may seem modern, but it's the same as the old goal, which is you're trying to make something look the same at this size as it looks at this size. And this is our job. Our job basically is to make a bunch of things that are actually all different look the same. Right? Got 26 letters, they're all different. We're trying to make them so they all look the same. That's our job. So that no, nothing sticks out, nothing disappears. And with variations, just a bigger, you know, the same. Uh, you want to make it so, I mean, I mean, I'm not saying that the thin and the black are supposed to be, look the same, but there's the same typeface, right, obviously. And uh, this is something that's new to variables, uh, that if you can establish trust between the user and the optical size, then effectively, as you say, that there's this inverse pyramid that we could never, we could never reach before. I couldn't give you 300 weights of the 144 point like I should be able to do because there's that many weights. Can go, you can have 300 weights. You can have you know, 400 widths up there for justification and for fitting lines at, at the largest sizes now. So they're distinctly different, that you can tell the difference between 400 different weights that we couldn't do before. It was just impossible. There was no way, you know, and typically what we'd do is you'd, we'd, you'd get four weights of the text face and four weights of the, <laughs> of the deck face and four weights of the display face because otherwise the user had to do this thing in their mind where, oh, here there are only four weights, and then here there are eight weights, and then there there are 32 weights. Uh, you know, uh, how big a menu do you want, you want to hit them with? You know? And how complicated a menu do you want to hit them with? And I talk about this in the brochure we've written, that the difference between the old families and the new families is we had to break up the old families in five different ways and give them to the user, you know, uh, piecemeal basically, and then they had to pick their way through to find the ones that they wanted. Now we can sort of they have a family, and they can pick any weight they want. And uh, one of the things I like about that is we don't have to name it all, because <laughs> uh, I've been running out of names for 30 years. For styles, I mean, you know, I, I read threads on the internet all the time. People are arguing about whether narrow is narrower than, than uh, Condense is it where, where and people are trying to put names on widths and it's it just I laugh quietly in my basement by myself I laugh you're never going to find all the names you need bud it's not it's not going to happen you're gonna, never going to find the names for weights I don't know what the solution is because people don't want numbers so the the solution that I've got is that you know when a user goes in and they they pick the styles they want they give them the names they want. You know, and that's essentially what you can do on the web, in web programming. I can pick out any instance and I can say that's bold, right? As long as I'm, you know, I, making, calling that instance in a name and I can just... Over the years you've, you've talked with me about this idea of relative typographic specification and as a way of uh, addressing that. Right? Monday. You can refer to things relatively. I go to work on it Monday. I've written, I've written my first page. Uh, you know, and what, what Dave and I are talking about here is that, you know, when you, when you work with the web type, there's a lot of inheritance, uh, or what is it called? Is it called inheritance? Yeah, a lot of stuff is inherent, and, and it's basically the mantra is all defaulted when you start, and you have to change things to, to make that happen. Um, and uh, so uh, with variable fonts, you, it's possible that you can say, here's my body. It's anywhere in the design space. It doesn't have to be the default of the variable font. You could use any font for your body. And you can program everything else from there. Um, size is the easiest one to do. If there's an optical size axis, you're going to get the size automatically. And you can you never have to name anything. You just say that uh, my bold is uh, 189 to my regular 144. And um, that opens up some interesting possibilities because all of our parametric values are based on percentage of the M, unlike OS2 values or uh, other um, older font classification systems. We just say that STEM is 10% of the M. And what that means is that I can compare that to any other font in the universe that is on the same universe, and they're going to be the same. Uh, if I find something else that's 10% on the M, they're both 10% on the M, and that's a pretty good match. Right? Um, and with variable fonts, if 
you know, a, a, an instance of a non-variable font isn't is what I want, but the variable isn't. I can bring the variable to that weight either visually by fishing for the right one, or numerically just say, you know, give me the same one. And you can do the same with heights. I mean, one of the oldest problems users have is that 12 point this is taller than 12 point that. And there's this silly thing that they've invented for the web for scaling the lowercase or scaling them together in some way that's pretty hokey. But the real way to do that is just, you know, make them the same height parametrically and uh, then go from there. I think that kind of goes back to my first uh, question I made a moment ago. So say you take a, you know, a famous face, you take, you take like Stempel, Garamond, regular, or Bauer, Bodoni, regular. Um, Not interstate? Or interstate. Okay, sure. let's, let's, let's do interstate. Let's go interstate. Um, <laughs> Just for some shameless plugs. What, what point size is interstate regular ideal for? How would you evaluate that as a, as a typographer? Today, I mean, it's the existing style? Right, you're looking at it. You're looking at, you know, the, the, the sort of uh, X opaque, X OPQ, you know, the width of the stems. Yeah. What is that? You say it's 10% of the M, but, but how does that translate into... A, uh, an optical size, a point size. Uh, well, there's a way there, there, there's a way to do it visually, which is what I typically do. I sit and look at, at, I mean, when you're deciding what the narrowest six point can be, there's no way to do it except for looking. And um, but we're doing some research into a related issue, which is that you have a dollar sign with a bar through it. And that has to change as it gets bolder because there isn't room for the bar because there are these two little counters, there's white spaces that are going to get filled in. So if I measure those white spaces and I use my eyes to figure out when that has to break, I can start to build a map of when that bar has to break based on how small that counter is getting versus the things, right? So beginning to do research into, you know, what it looks like when, or what the value is when my eye says change that, okay? Now, doing, relating that to optical size, I can look at the weight going down and say, I can't see it anymore, for example. Or it doesn't read as well. Uh, and we are starting to build a database of the values that are related to that. And that's the only way to do it that I know of. There's a much more complicated thing, which is that I'm trying to take this job of changing weights and changing spacing away from the user and giving them optical size instead. And the way you do that is by just doing the same thing that the different weight changes were doing. So I, I, I look at my weights going down and my, my type going down through the sizes, and I say, is this still looking the same or is there a change going on there? And so once I've got that thing smooth where it's looking the same, then the next problem is how do different devices change it? And there's a lot of issues with that because uh, white and black scale differently and uh, white and black are handled differently. And white and black can be reversed in dark mode, for example. So, so um, if you have, uh, you know, designed, like you said, the registered axes of optical size across weight and width, um, and then you want to then, you know, assess the parametric uh, sort of values of the extremes of that space. So you say at your optical size max, at your weight minimum, at your width minimum. What are these, you know, values for the X opaque, X transparent, Y opaque, Y transparent? Um, do you see that as you, you know, you can kind of measure those things in the way you've described, that there's then a way to automate the development of the parametric masters and the parametric axes? Yes. So yes. that if, if a, you know... A in fact, I, I have met developers who can automatically generate our parametric axes the glyphs themselves. So it's a question of just doing enough research so that you know uh, what it means, what those changes need to be.
to uh, be effective. So, and it, again, it, it depends on what you're doing for the client. So for grades, for example, there are different uses for grades. There's uh, a range of grade that's good for making changes because of rendering, and that's the smallest range. There's a larger range you need for dark mode. And then there's a huge range you need for design so that people can a fishing design. fish, they can design with any weight on any width, anywhere, and change it to any weight they want without changing the layout. So there, there's a range of grade possible that's depending on what they want to do with it. Um, and we're still doing research on that, but we have a pretty good idea that that's the order of things. We have a pretty good idea that the order of things in determining how the do dollar sign bar breaks, we're figuring out how to do that. And all this is open source. This is, we're all doing this in the open. We're not making any high, hidden, hidden tricks here. We're documenting everything we're doing so that everybody can see uh, our mistakes, which we've done it before in hints, and uh, we'll now do it again in variable fonts. Uh, yeah. So where would this open source be if we want to get? Uh, oh, you want to know that? Yes. <laughs> they want to know everything. It's a Git. Uh, it's a Git Hub okay. repository. Uh, that's there's an old one called Amstrad Alpha, which was the first one. It's all 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 the mess is over there, and now there's a whole new mess because uh, we've started over um, for Amstrad, and they're both uh, open to the public as far as I know. Okay, and then you said you're publishing something. On Monday? Uh, yeah, this brochure that we showed that goes through the examples that we, we have developed some of the things that I showed in this presentation and talked about. We've developed that into examples that you can play with uh, on okay. the web and stuff. And uh, are you writing about it or are you just... We will be writing about it. Uh, I have to get some approvals from various people to release it because it's not all our images and stuff. So I'm still chasing down some people in the Netherlands and stuff. Thanks. Yeah. All right. I think we've uh, we've run in a little over yeah. eight now. Um, yep. Carol. Can I do that? Yeah. Okay. So I just want to say thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, David, for everything. You're thank outrageous. You. And um, a special thank you to Dave uh, Corsland and Google for uh, having us this evening. So hope to get to see you at all the TGC events. Thank you.